but uh, this week we are delighted to have Matthew Preby here, and uh, basically I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you for being here. With the, uh, there we go, the microphone. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn out the lights. Uh, we will not need them, and the better, the darker it is, the better the pictures will look. Okay, good. Let's see, I'm going to need to. Oh, that's, that's blinding right there. <laughs> Let me move over a little bit. So it's actually it's okay here. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's morning. good of you to be here. Um, first of all, I want to know how many were here at either one of my previous two presentations at this Sabbath school. Um, about a third half of you. Okay. I'm going to give a little bit of introduction of who I am and what I do for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name is Matthew Preby. I travel around the United States for over half the year holding meetings across the country with my father's ministry. And uh, we have been doing this now um, for the last uh, five years, um, ever since uh, I got married and uh, my wife travels around with us. And so we're on the road for uh, most of the year doing holding meetings across the country. Um, every weekend we're at a new church, and uh, it's been kind of unusual. We've been stuck in one place down here in Loma Linda for the last three weeks. That's about the most we're ever in one place at one time. And usually we're always off to new areas. And so in that process, I'm always studying nature because I'm a naturalist. I study animals in their natural habitat wherever we happen to be. And so I've been doing that for the last uh, 23 years where I've been able to see animals pretty much wherever we go across North America, wherever habitats we happen to be in, whether it's forests or mountains or the sea coasts or swamps, wherever we are, I will be out looking for the wildlife that uh, is there, usually hiding away in nooks and crannies. All the pictures you're seeing uh, in this presentation um, are pictures taken by either myself or my wife, mostly my wife, she's the photographer, and so all these pictures are actually our own that we have been able to uh, take wherever we go. And so in the last two times that I've presented here, we were talking about very specific issues of creation and evolution and how the animal world in its infinite diversity and variety proclaims the truth of creation and the hopelessness of evolution. Because animals are too well designed and too well built and too well put together to ever be the results of blind chance. And so that's what we basically looked at the last couple of years uh, when we were here. I've, it's been a couple of years since I've been here, but this previous two meetings. And so that today we're going to be doing something a little bit more focused than we did before where before we were looking about the general principles of creation and evolution and God's handiwork. Today we're going to tackle a very specific topic of the predators and what is their purpose, where do they come from, and how do we relate to them as part of the natural world. So I'm going to go ahead and get off this slideshow into the main presentation and we'll get started. There will be plenty of time for questions at the end. This is not as long a presentation as some of my other ones that I have done. And so we'll have plenty of time to uh, ask any questions that you have about this because I actually invite and solicit discussion on this topic. This is a very um, unusual topic. And so if you uh, have anything to say, please do so. <coughs> Predators, what are they? Why are they here? And most importantly, who put them here? Did God create them, or are they the products of Satan's foul designs? Wouldn't we be better off without them, by getting rid of them whenever possible? In this presentation, we will examine this evidence to make sense of this difficult topic. To start, we need to be very clear that very little inspiration sheds light on this area. There are hints and ideas, but few unmistakable statements. This doesn't mean that we should ignore these questions, as virtually everybody makes up their own mind about them anyway. The trouble with most people's opinions is that most of their opinions are based upon cultural biases, personal prejudices, or the usually contradictory divisions of nature into the good animals and into the bad animals. Now I'm going to address this program this morning from my perspective as a naturalist. Being a general naturalist has many advantages and that provides a look sometimes at the big picture that sometimes a specialist look will not notice. So we will start with some foundations that underlie all else of everything I will be talking about today. I hold the following basic and critical premises. In the beginning, God made all life on earth in six days, resting on the seventh day. Everything was perfect. There was no death or decay, disease or corruption. All animals were vegetarian, as no animal killed another animal for food. 
in Genesis 1, verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Now when we see the word meat in the King James Version of the Bible, the Hebrew word translated as meat actually means the nonspecific word food. In the context, we'll determine what kind of food is referred to, plants for vegetarians, or after the fall, meat, flesh for the uh, meat eaters. In the garden, in the perfect Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were at peace with all life around them. They neither harmed any animals nor were harmed by them. Then sin came and everything became ruined and broken. Now everyone who trusts the biblical account in Genesis will agree with these basic premises. But now is where our problem begins. Death is evil, ugly, and cruel. Even when death brings an end to suffering and pain, it is still not part of God's perfect plan and is totally opposed to his nature. So where did the predators come from? First of all, we need a clear definition of terms. What exactly are predators? And by definition, those that are not predators. Animals can be divided into three major groups based on their lifestyle and upon their diet. To start are the herbivores. Now this group is a huge group that contains all the vegetarian animals. This includes many subgroups that I will not be listing by their technical names, but this covers eaters of grass, nuts, wood, nectar, fungus, pollen, roots, leaves, algae, fruits and vegetables. Now each subgroup has its own design of teeth, stomach, and intestines that will clearly tell you what that animal eats even if you never watch that species feeding. Second group are the predators. Now this group is much larger than most people realize since the popular idea of this group is limited to raw meat eaters like sharks, leopards, and eagles. But this is just a subgroup of the predators called the carnivores. Other subgroups include fish eaters like seals, cormorants, and water snakes. A mass of subgroups includes eaters of insects and spiders. Many birds that we admire and love are in fact voracious predators, devouring insects by the thousands. Many small mammals, virtually all spiders, a high percentage of insects, most frogs and toads, and all salamanders feed in this way. A final subgroup includes the scavengers, those animals who feed on animals which are already dead. Many animals who kill their own food will eat carrion on occasion, but some species specialize on this diet. Many insects, like flies and wasps, eat carrion when they are young. Others do so their whole life, such as crabs, vultures, hagfish, and sea snails. So we need to realize that there are far more predators in this world than most people realize. This includes many species that we categorize as the good animals, like ladybird beetles, whales, frogs, and cranes, as well as we, what we call the bad animals, like alligators and wolves. The third group are the parasites. Now the parasites are the, by far the smallest group, specialists that live either outside or inside other animals. They feed on blood or skin or muscle or drain nutrients from their host internally. Their actions weaken their hosts, but the parasite's goal is usually not to kill. Death may result if too many parasites weaken a host too much, or a disease carried by the parasite may kill the host. But that is not intentional or even beneficial to the parasite, since most often they will die when their host dies. So these three categories cover virtually all the food choices made by animals. Now, many fit into more than one of these categories, as a huge number of predators will also eat plants. Now, we call bears predators, but only the polar bear is totally a meat eater. Most bears eat both plants and animals. The spectacled bear eats only plants. The panda bear eats only bamboo. Now, as a side note, can anyone guess which group humans belong to? Most people assume that we are carnivores or possibly omnivores, which are eaters of both plants and flesh. But if we examine our teeth, stomach, and intestines, 
and then compare them to the various designs that we find in nature, we will find that humans belong to the subcategory of herbivores called the frugivores. When we eat meat, it doesn't digest properly and creates physical ailments. That's why even perfectly healthy meat will still make humans sick, as our bodies are only marginally able to process flesh in our diet. So now we can explore the origins of these three groups to decide where they came from. Herbivores obviously came from the very beginning, as created in the Garden of Eden. But what about the predators, and by extension the parasites? Can we discover who created them? There are three options. Option number one, the predators somehow developed on their own, gradually changing from plant eaters to flesh eaters. Option number two, Satan made the predators, either directly or indirectly. Option number three, God recreated certain animals so that they could kill other animals and eat them. Now let's examine each option to see what is possible and what is reasonable. Option number one, if we accept the first option, we are accepting a form of mechanistic evolution. The change from a plant eater to a meat eater is immense. Teeth must transform from grinding and mashing to tearing and slicing. Stomach and intestines must shrink from long and convoluted to short and straight because longer is better for digesting plants and shorter is better for digesting flesh. Paws must now be armed for catching and holding struggling prey. And perhaps most importantly, the brain must change. The very thoughts must be altered because from looking at a leaf, and thinking that that tastes good. Now an animal must now find the leaf inedible and instead hunger for another living animal. All of these are major changes that have to take place. If we accept a gradual change for this process, then how can we attack the Darwinists who claim the same process for all life on Earth? I reject this option for the same reason that I reject macroevolution because a gradual change from a reptile to a mammal or a bird is as scientifically unlikely as a gradual change from a vegetarian cat to a meat-eating one. We do not see this taking place in today's world any more than we see a bear turning into a seal. Or what about insect-eating bats? Now, in my first presentation I gave here about four years ago, we looked at night flying bats which use echolocation to maneuver. Now the echolocation systems that these bats use stagger the mind with their complexity. There is no need for a day active fruit eating bat like a flying fox to have echolocation. So how could this system have developed gradually as bats evolve into night flying insect hunting specialists? If a bat can evolve a system that makes our own sonar look primitive, then how can we say that the Darwinists are wrong? We are wasting our time attacking them. So I reject option number one as not possible under the biological processes that I see in nature. Option number two, the second choice, that Satan created predators in some angry effort to increase the pain and suffering of life on Earth has serious problems. Ellen White has stated unequivocally that Satan does not have the power to create life. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 264. The prince of evil, though possessing all the wisdom and might of an angel fallen, has not the power to create or to give life. This is the prerogative of God alone. So I take that as definitive and will not consider that as an option. But some people say that Satan modified early life in the original fall twisting pre-existing forms to suit his own purposes. Now, Ellen White actually gives support to this idea in, as the origin of many of the dangerous plants in our world. This actually makes sense from a biological standpoint as well. Breeders have been developing weird strains of plants and animals for thousands of years. In the animal world, we have hairless cats, voiceless dogs, flightless birds, and sterile insects. Our modifications of plants have been even more extreme. So if we can do this, how much more could Satan do? Perhaps he worked either directly himself or by directing his agents after the fall. 
This would appear to be a reasonable answer for the parasite category. For every parasite, we find closely related forms which are not parasites, which in fact are either harmless or beneficial. Ticks suck blood and transmit disease, but mites are nearly identical to ticks and many are valuable for eating minute detritus. Worms that invade the body and drain resources have relatives that aerate the soil and recycle nutrients. Flies that bite or spread disease are virtually identical to the vast majority of species that are nectar feeders and crucial to pollination. Even the blood-sucking mosquitoes that can make the outdoors so miserable have an interesting twist. Only the females drink blood as part of their reproductive process. You have never been bitten by a male mosquito, ever. The males peacefully drink nectar from meadow flowers. So we can easily see here how an insect created by God in Eden could be changed only slightly to now drink blood. From a tube mouth used to drink nectar, a slight change to a cutting tool tube uh, to drink blood is not nearly so difficult a change as a change from a grass-eating animal to a meat-eating one. So the parasites may well be good candidates for small-scale modifications that Satan could have done to the physical and mental makeup of the various species. But could Satan have taken berry-eating birds and altered them to eat insects or fish or even other birds? It would be a greater change than needed for the parasites, but perhaps it is within Satan's power to do so. So we will leave this as an option for now. Option number three. The final option is that God made the predators in essence, recreating some of the animals at the time of the fall. Now, obviously, there is no lack of power. God could do this as easily as he made them vegetarian in the first place. But to say that God remade them would mean that he is responsible for their behavior. It would mean that sharks kill seals because God made them that way. It would mean that a praying mantis kills other insects because God chose that lifestyle for her. This is an idea we find distasteful and wrong, since God cannot be in favor of death. So to review, slow adaptation is impossible. Satan can make limited changes, but not enough to fully suit our situation. And God could easily make the predators, but we assume he wouldn't create evil. But are predators really evil as we presume? Is taking the life of another being inherently evil always? In a perfect world, death is non-existent. Since Adam's sin, our world is contaminated by death and will be until remade into the new earth. Once sin began, all species and all aspects of this world changed in some form or another. All animals will eventually die. It's only a matter of how and when. So let's pretend that no predators ever existed, that the herbivores in the Garden of Eden stayed herbivores forever, even after the fall. What would have happened? At first, they would have spread as they reproduced, individuals dying of old age and accident, but their population steadily increasing. At a certain point, depending on how large an area they inhabit and how healthy the plant food available, the members of any particular species will reach what is called carrying capacity. This means the amount of plant food available is totally eaten every year by the animals. But the animals are still reproducing, and the food can't grow any faster. So the, uh, there is not enough food to go around. The herbivores are forced to compete for food, the stronger outcompeting the weaker. Many go hungry. Their immune systems are weakened, and disease can take hold. Eventually, starvation begins as the full misery sets in. Starving to death is a bad way to die. Hungry, weak, the individual's slowly fades away until finally, miserably, miserably, death results. Between disease and starvation, the population crashes, and it falls to a far less number than the maximum level reached before the crash. Now, with plenty of food available for a smaller group size, the population begins to increase again. Eventually, the group builds past the carrying capacity and crashes again. This wildly fluctuating cycle of rising and crashing populations has no end. 
It will continue indefinitely as long as no outside forces interfere. This system is not pleasant. The death endured by these animals is slow, painful, and ugly. This is how the Earth would be everywhere if no predators existed. But now let's put predators into our thought experiment. Meat eaters try to catch as many as they can to feed themselves and their young. But catching food that doesn't want to be caught is no easy task, and the parasites fail to catch prey far more often than they succeed. The most likely targets are the oldest, the weakest, the youngest, and the sick. They are slightly slower and easier to catch, so they are the ones most likely caught. This doesn't mean that they are the only ones caught by predators, as some people think. Random chance, perseverance, or surprise will allow a predator to catch even the fittest, most healthy prey. But this will be a low fraction of the total prey caught. The larger the prey base, the more will be available to those hunting them, and the predator population will be able to increase as well. But when the weak and excess are being removed by the predators, the prey base will not increase as rapidly, or it might not increase at all, as birth rate equals death rate to old age and predators combined. This would mean the herbivores would not exceed the food availability limit. With enough food to go around, the plant eaters are not as susceptible to disease, and they certainly won't starve. Once again, this balanced system can continue indefinitely unless altered by outside forces. When a predator kills a victim, the end is relatively fast and painless when compared to a death by starvation and disease. Death by predator is still ugly and unpleasant, but it is more merciful than the alternative. Predator numbers are determined by prey numbers, not the other way around. Predators limit, but do not control prey populations. This is important and usually not well understood by us. By definition, there are never too many predators in any given habitat because they can only survive if there is enough prey available for them to eat. If prey numbers drop, the predator numbers will drop along with them. Under normal conditions, it is impossible for predators to exterminate the food that they are eating. Now what happens when predators are removed by humans? There are endless examples of this, but one of the most famous took place on the north rim of the Grand Canyon in an area called the Kaibab Plateau. Now this area is an island of forests surrounded by desert, full of deer, bear, cougar, coyote, and squirrels. Around 1900, human deer hunters pressured the government to kill all the predators on the plateau. This would mean more deer available to the humans, and who wouldn't want that, right? So genocide began, and soon all the cougars and the bear were gone. The coyotes were destroyed as well, even though they were virtually no threat to the deer. Coyotes don't kill healthy adult deer. They usually go after small mammals, but often settle for carrion, since coyotes are too small to attack large animals. The Kaibab deer population soared as planned, and great times for human hunters resulted. But the hurt deer numbers kept climbing, despite the huge hunter kill rate. Soon the deer herd had doubled, and then quadrupled. More, more and more deer were shot, but that didn't help, because the herd increased still. In 1906, when predator killing began in earnest, the deer numbered about 4,000. By 1924, they reached 100,000 deer. And hard winter set in, and the deer starved by the thousands. <coughs> 60% of the herd starved in two years. By 1931, they had sunk to 20,000, and by 1939, they fell to 10,000. It was a wildlife disaster that woke people up to the value of predators in that habitat. Since then, studies around the world have confirmed the role of predators in every wildlife system. Ecosystems with full level levels of predators and prey stay in equilibrium, with no large fluctuations. But as soon as humans trap, shoot, or poison the local predators, everything falls apart. This is why deer numbers have exploded across North America. When market hunters decimated deer in the 1800s for public sale, deer were on the verge of disappearing from large areas of America. Hunters with power and influence took steps to protect deer from market hunting and replace it with sport hunting. 
Limits were set and land set aside as protected refuges. Females were left alone and only males were killed. Predators already losing ground were pushed completely out of the eastern United States. Deer increased nicely, but the faulty system hunters favored again led to disaster. With no predators left, humans assumed that role, but they didn't do it correctly. Humans killed the healthiest males for trophies, not the weakest available as normal predators would do. With a huge imbalance of far more females to males, the deer reproduced far faster than they would normally do. Also, humans kill a far higher proportion of the herd than predators ever kill. Deer respond when a large portion of the herd dies by increasing their birth rate. Instead of an average of one fawn per doe born per year, now each doe will produce two to three per year. All of these factors combine to cause the deer population to climb higher than ever human hunters can control them. Soon, deer numbers explode exponentially, and now there are more deer than there have ever been in the history of North America. Deer are shot in huge numbers. Deer starve during hard winters in huge numbers. Deer are hit by cars in huge numbers, which kill many people in the process. And deer die from disease from overcrowding in huge numbers. All of this suffering and waste to provide plenty of sport for your average Joe shooting anyone that moves. This is one of the well-hidden secrets of state game management, that sport hunting, as managed for the last century, actually raises deer populations instead of reducing them. This shows that replacing wild predators with sport hunting has been one of the worst mistakes possible. This principle applies to whatever predator-prey population we study. Those areas of the U.S. that still engage in the disgrace of rattlesnake roundups have documented higher rodent populations than areas with unmolested snakes. This means that regions that destroy their snakes have higher disease rates and increased crop losses than those areas that do not damage their snakes due to the unnaturally high rodent numbers. Instead of being our enemy, snakes are our allies in maintaining our quality of life. So my point is this, a world with death but no predators is actually worse in many ways than a world with both death and predators. This goes against the grain of our thinking but is a logical deduction. Would Satan really want to make predators? To not have predators exist would have increased the suffering and pain of the natural world after the fall. For Satan to invent predators would have defeated his own purposes. So if we view predators through the lens of reality rather than our cultural biases, we find that God's involvement in making them doesn't seem so bad. Does God want death and killing? Of course not, but Adam's sin forced death to exist. So God has made the best of a bad situation by balancing the system as much as possible. Instead of an evil force, a product of Satan's spite, predation is in fact a useful and comparatively compassionate way to regulate entire ecosystems, preventing them from spiraling into chaos. In fact, we should be grateful for the services of most predators. Bats and birds and spiders devour insects. Without them, we would be buried by insects, and they would reproduce as they would reproduce until they overran everything else. Rodents also have a huge reproductive rate. Everyone eats rodents, it seems. Reptile, bird, and mammal predators include many rodent eaters. Be glad for this, for without the snakes and the hawks and the weasels catching the many forms of small rodents, disease would run rampant. Remember the plagues of the Dark Ages. They happened because the Catholic Church promoted the genocide of cats, as cats were considered evil. This allowed rats carrying diseased fleas to multiply and spread all over Europe. Most exotic animal infestations are due to species being transported to places where there are no native predators to limit them. When Australians introduced European rabbits as a new human food source, they overpopulated to the point of ecological disaster, eating all the grass and overwhelming the landscape. Predators prevent and minimize disease in every ecosystem in the world. 
Satan wants the rodent population to explode and eat our food and spread disease. Satan does not want the snakes and the falcons and the foxes to eat the rodents and limit their numbers. So when we actually think about it, we are glad that these predators exist. We are glad that insects and rodents are reduced by other animals, even when we still don't like the animals who are doing the reducing. What we especially seem to resent are the predators that kill the three types of animals that we most care about. First are the cute animals, bunnies and cardinals and baby deer. They are of no more inherent value than any other animal, but we object to seeing the hawk eating the cute little squirrel. Second are the wild animals. We have economic interest in killing ourselves. When an elk is killed by a cougar, it means we can't kill that elk ourselves and put his head on our wall. If a cormorant eats a fish, it means we can't hook that fish ourselves on a line for sport. Third are the domestic animals that we have economic interest in ourselves. We raise sheep and cattle as commodities to be slaughtered for our own profit. And any predation, which means money taken out of our pocket, is considered the worst thing ever. Skunks in the hen house mean fewer eggs to sell. These three categories are where we really acquire our cultural biases and hatred of predators. Soulless industry puts out propaganda about vicious killers crippling our way of life. Ranchers invent wild stories about how wolves are on their doorstep trying to eat them even when such stories are absolute rubbish. There is no documented case of a healthy wolf ever killing a person in North America, ever. Lies combined with cultural bias lead us to consider all predators evil and deserving of persecution, if not eradication. We are upset when humans kill cute vegetarian animals, but when meat eaters are killed, we let it pass since we know down deep that after all, they probably came from Satan anyway. So we turn a blind eye to the predator destruction or actively promote it as a good thing. In the end, we are falling for Satan's lies since he is the one who wants the predators to be wiped out and the natural balance destroyed. When we destroy predators, we are annihilating the animals that God has put on this planet to keep it functional in a sinful state. Instead of eliminating evil, we are actually promoting evil, promoting Satan's desires to increase suffering, both the immediate suffering of the predators themselves and the long-term suffering of the increasingly numerous herbivores that will then overpopulate and starve. But is there any biological evidence for the idea that God made a special recreation at the time of the fall. Is there any organism which clearly is not part of Eden, which had to have begun after the fall, and which is too sophisticated to be the product of Satan's modifications of pre-existing life forms? It turns out that there is a type of life that exactly fits these criteria. We are very familiar with this organism, but most people are unaware of how unusual they really are. When you look at a mushroom, what are you seeing? The colorful above ground structure is only the tip of the iceberg. It is the reproductive component of fungus, the source of spores that will drift on the wind and start new fungus growth elsewhere. The actual fungus is the hidden tendrils that grow through the wood and the soil. Concealed from view, these white tendrils grow and spread through every available source of nourishment. Funguses live everywhere, but most are impossible to tell apart visually, as they all look like white threads. But when the time comes to reproduce, fungus will grow a structure that is so unique to each species that naturalists will be able to tell them apart just looking at that. The mushrooms we see on the ground and rotting wood are comparable to an apple or a pine cone on a tree, just a temporary growth whose only function is reproduction. But then what purpose do the fungal threads themselves serve? What exactly does fungus do? The only job of fungus, the only job of fungus, is to break down the cells of other organisms, usually plants, and turn them into nutrients that can be used as nourishment. They are the great recyclers of the world, 
crucial to turning useless dead matter into vital nutrients. Without fungus, dead leaves and wood would never decay and would pile up uselessly, letting nothing new grow. So fungus must exist or life on Earth would be impossible. Let me say that again. Fungus must exist. But how could fungus exist in Eden? There was no dead matter to recycle. There was no possible function for fungus in a perfect world. Perhaps fungus is, is an example of some Eden plant that, some was, that was slightly modified to fit a new job in a sinful world. But there is a major problem with this concept. Fungus is not a plant. Fungus is not related to plants. Fungus is not related to animals. Fungus is a totally separate branch of life. The cell structure of fungus is fundamentally different from plant cells, and there is an important reason for this. Cells of all plants are made from cellulose. This is what makes a plant a plant. But the cells of fungus are made from chitin. This is what makes a fungus a fungus. The reason for this becomes clear when we remember what fungus does. Fungus breaks down plants into usable nutrients. How? Fungus has an extremely powerful acid that digests cellulose. This acid is perfectly designed to dissolve plant cells. But what keeps the fungus acid from damaging their own cells? Well, the acid di dissolves cellulose perfectly, but doesn't dissolve chitin, which is what makes up the fungus' own cells. So fungus is immune to the acid that it uses. If fungus wasn't foundationally different from plants, it couldn't function as it does. It is a different form of life from plants in every way. The changes needed to turn a plant into a fungus are much greater than the changes needed to turn a vegetarian animal into a meat-eating one, because the latter change involves changing details of anatomy and behavior, not a total conversion of every cell in an organism, as it would be from a plant cell to a fungus cell. The fact that fungus is small and usually hidden is irrelevant. Fungus could not exist in Eden, as it would serve no purpose and would have no nourishment before decay began. If fungus wasn't created at the fall, something else would be needed to do the same job. Satan would not create fungus, even if he could. Why would he want new life to grow by recycling the nutrients? Fungus couldn't evolve from plants any more than birds could evolve from jellyfish. What all of this means is that fungus was a new creation by God to fit the changed conditions of a sinful world. So we have in the weird, colorful world of the mushrooms a clear case of God making something totally new that feeds upon death. There is no reason to suppose that there is any difference with animal predators. Because of sin, death needs to be controlled and minimized. Predators do just that, making the world better than it would be without them. This is why God made them and made them very well. When we look at any predator, be it fish or mammal, reptile or spider, we find them to be a masterpiece of design and specialization. When we remind ourselves how many animals actually are predators, to exclude them from God's creation would leave very few animals left to consider. Predators are as intricate and amazing as any herbivore, and to disdain them as results of chaos, Satan, or man's manipulation is to make a mockery of the evidence. So, we've looked at the idea of predators from logic and reason, but what does inspiration tell us? To start off, if predators are not part of God's plan, then why did he allow them on Noah's Ark? The whole point of the flood was to cleanse the world of evil, to start fresh with a remnant. Why not keep all the good vegetarian animals and drown all the bad meat eaters? But that's not what happened. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 97, beasts of every description, the fiercest, as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. God's miracle brought representatives of animals that we don't approve of. What should that tell us? The Bible states repeatedly that God provides for the animals. In Psalms 104, he sendeth the springs into the valleys, which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. 
He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle. So, God gives water to the animals and vegetation to the herbivores. It sounds so fine so far. But then things get uncomfortable for our preconceptions. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. That can't be right. We're sure of it. God wouldn't give meat to lions. But it continues. In the sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Sometimes we forget that the vast majority of sea life is carnivorous, and God provides for them all. And it doesn't matter how we interpret Leviathan as crocodile, serpent, or whale, there are no vegetarian whales. When God speaks to Job, listing the Lord's many tasks man is incapable of performing, he says, Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion, or fill the appetite of the young lions? Who provideth for the raven his food? And let's make no mistake, ravens are flesh eaters. In Job 39, verses 26 to 30, God takes credit for the skills and behavior of the hawks and the eagles, all of which are meat eaters. In Psalms 147, he, the Lord, giveth the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. Now in the Hebrew, the first half of this verse refers to a plant eater, the beast, and the second half refers to a meat eater, ravens. We accept the first half as divine providence, but deny the second half. But scripture doesn't allow us the luxury of such caviling. We either must accept the entire verse or invent hypocritical and contradictory theories to explain the second half away to suit our prejudices. And for those people who dismiss these verses as poetical and therefore irrelevant, we also have the direct and plain words of Jesus himself. In Luke 12, 24, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. So God clearly takes responsibility for feeding all the animals, both predator and vegetarian. But there's one other point to consider. Isaiah gave a prophetic vision of the new earth to come, when all life would be recreated in a perfect and peaceful state. All animals will once again be plant eaters. Those animals specifically listed in Isaiah, found in Isaiah 11 and 65, include wolves, lions, leopards, bears, and several kinds of snakes. This is in Isaiah 11, 6 to 8, and 65, verse 25. The real question is why would God recreate animals that Satan was responsible for? If predators are products of evil, they should be destroyed with sin. Instead, God restores them to their original Eden form in the same way that mankind will be restored to their original nature. Once their vital role as ecosystem regulators is no longer needed, they will be changed back to the peaceful animals that they were at the very beginning. Now that we have established the origin of so many of Earth's creatures, how does that affect our attitude and relationship to them? It is human nature to dismiss and despise what we designate as evil. As long as we consider predators to be agents of Satan, we will ignore or participate in any persecution against them. We kill hawks because they catch cute rabbits, or wolves for eating cows, or snakes just for being snakes. These actions have no moral problems if the only ones being killed are inherently evil. But when we understand that these animals are under God's care, since he made them the way they are, then that changes our entire attitude toward their destruction. We realize that our duty to do no harm to them is no less than our duty to do no harm to any of God's creation. Of course, this does not mean that we can't protect ourselves from attack. The biblical principles of self-defense apply to both animals and people. But we have absolutely no permission to destroy life solely due to its nature. Shark fishing, coyote poisoning, alligator farming, fox ranching, bear hunting, bobcat trapping, crow shooting. These are all examples of blatant cruelty that we should oppose categorically. We should also stop killing those backyard creatures that have committed no wrong. There is no bird actually called chicken hawk, only ignorance has named them that. 
Mountain lions do not need to be thinned out for their own good. Weasels are not mindless butchers killing more than they need. Bats are not Dracula in disguise. The unrelenting savagery directed against wolves to prop up the evil of the ranching industry must end. Right now, over the last six months, um, nearly a thousand wolves have been shot over the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming as their protections have been stripped from them and they are being massacred by traps and guns and every way that they can possibly find to kill them. All of which is totally and utterly to support the sport hunting industry and the ranching industry. Pike fish do not need to be poisoned to preserve trout so that we can torture the trout to death ourselves. Seals need not be brutally clubbed to keep them from eating the ocean's fish. The practical applications extend into many areas and are crucially important. Ellen White describes God's creation and how it was marred by sin. But she states how even now nature works in harmony according to God's plans. Note how she words the interrelation of all animals. This is Desire of Ages, page 20. In the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was he that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and air and sky, he wrote the message of the Father's love. Now sin has marred God's perfect work, yet that handy work remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself, no bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. All life benefits other life. Only man is selfish. The innocent animals fulfill their role in God's creation. Predators do what their God-given behavior demands of them, and nature is the better for it. Once we expand our circle of compassion to include the predators, we will have made the next step forward to fulfilling our God-given responsibilities toward his created beings. Will we continue to be the agents of Satan and his destructive, cruel, and vindictive anti-predator agenda? Or do we have it within ourselves to care for all the living souls of God's creation? Let us be Christ-like Christians in every area of our lives. Life is a beautiful and wonderful gift that God has given to his created beings. Each of us has the opportunity to cherish life in all the many forms that God has fashioned. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. So at this point, if we want to have any questions or any announcements you want to make at this point, I will be happy to take any and all questions you have. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I very much appreciate this. Uh, I uh, have just a few, couple little questions about uh, your idyllic Garden of Eden before sin, before the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's along the line of, uh, there were no fun, fungi there, of course, because there's no, mm -hmm. what happened to the apple cores that Adam ate? Uh, what happened to the petals of the flowers that have to fall before fruit develops. Mm -hmm. uh, could there not have been fungi before then, uh, okay. during the Garden of Eden? Okay. All right. The questions of how the processes of nature work in a perfect world have been speculated upon in a great many ways. And to this date, we can speculate, but we have no inspiration giving us much information. When Ellen White says that there is no death of any sort in the original garden, does that mean that a fruit being plucked off of a tree and consumed, is that fruit dying? The tree itself that produced it isn't dying. So is the fruit, the cells of that fruit dying or is it being recycled into a new form that doesn't really qualify under the category of death? Um, 
the petals that fall off the flowers? Is everything working in the garden even exactly like we see it working today in terms of the processes of pollination and the processes of flowering and fruiting and that sort of thing? Or was there a different system that God set in motion at the time of the fall for a changed conditions? We don't have enough evidence to really give anything hard and fast. One thing we do know, and this is a, um, a discussion I was just having with uh, Doug a couple days ago, is um, there is in the entire universe many things that don't seem to fit very well the categories of life and death. Um, when we see a supernova exploding and basically destroying itself out in space, perfect universe, how is that part of a perfect universe? Because something is changing and turning into a thing that it wasn't before. When we see a black hole that is consuming all energy that is, comes near it and is basically, as far as we can tell, destroying that energy taking into it, is that a product of sin? Apparently not, because it's throughout the universe and we have good evidence of black holes. And so does that mean that God sets in motion recyclers of the universe's nutrients in the entire uh, way that we have a difficult time comprehending in our sin-filled world? So destruction in the universe, which appears to be destruction, perhaps is not sin. And so the destruction of an apple core by its e being eaten and the flowers and things like that perhaps do not qualify as death in the same way that we qualify death in our perfect world. That would be the most I would want to say in a technical way about that because uh, we don't have much evidence in that regard. Uh, let me go just a little step further. Okay. How did the elephants keep from walking on the ants and killing them in the Garden of Eden? Um, I would say that God's power is supreme, that he prevents that sort of thing from happening, and if an elephant steps on an ant, that God protects him from harm and uh, makes it possible for him to avoid dying. That would be the only speculation I would have because, again, we don't have enough evidence, but when Ellen White says there's no death, I take that at literal uh, information. I, <coughs> I want to proceed even further. We now know and there is a great deal of interest in it um, that uh, there are more bacterial cells in each of us than there are mm -hmm. cells in our bodies. Yes. And that the bacterial the genome that each of us carries around with us is, is critical for uh, many purposes, including uh, producing nutrients that don't otherwise occur mm -hmm. and that, uh, at least at the present time, we are absolutely dependent upon yes. or we die. Yes. Um, that would be true of, of all animals in the Garden of Eden in a peaceable kingdom. Uh, how, uh, if there are no fungi, um, uh, no bacteria that transform our foodstuffs into absorbable nutrients, mm -hmm. how do we deal with that <coughs> in the Garden of Eden? Okay. Um, with, fun me. with fungi, it's a little easier because fungi doesn't help us internally in any way possible. Um, it is an external thing that uh, deals with soil, wood, plant material, um, and that sort of thing that doesn't actually... Uh, it, we don't have fungi in our system. That is, to, We have bacteria in our system. That we is have yeast in our system. Well, okay. All right. And uh, yeast is a cousin of fungi, <laughs> and it's, so it's, uh, we're, we're, it's, 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 it's close. Um, and so I do agree with that. Um, whether or not, again, bacteria dis breaking down those structures, again, does that qualify as evil? Or is that part of the beneficial system that God had in place in Eden? I think it would be beneficial, you know, without being a source of evil. And so the time of the fall changes everything, and everything we look now at is plan B. Everything is a backup plan. I mean, even the the cute little vegetarian animals. Why, are they, why does the rabbit have big feet and can run really fast? Well, it's to avoid being eaten. Were they that way in the garden? Um, it becomes another source of speculation. How did God modify the herbivores to avoid being eaten at the time of the fall? And how do we have original forms of these animals in the perfect world? And we don't have any information on that specifically. And so everything changes at the time of the fall. And I believe that fungi were instituted at that point. I do hold that as being something that we do now have that was different. Because again, there is no tree collapsing in the forest that is now needing to be decayed and renewed and sent nutrients back unless we totally don't understand how Eden worked. Yes, um, when, when, when individuals ask us about the problem of overpopulation before mm -hmm. sin, 
how do we respond to okay, that Okay, uh, yes, and you see, <laughs> everything we're dealing with here is, again, speculation. We have two options when it comes to how the world was set up. We have either a very limited source of animals and, and being basically put into Garden of Eden uh, form, and we have two people, and that's like the core that then is going to reproduce and spread throughout the entire world and get to a place where it fills to capacity the entire planet up to a very healthy and stable uh, situation. At that point, then one of two things has to happen. Either s death starts to take place, which obviously God isn't going to do on his own, or God through his power, ends reproduction at a point where it is no longer expanding and filling up and overpopulating and, and dealing with that. So at some place that has to happen. Now the second option is that God made the entire planet Earth with its entire component of all nature, all life, all animals inherently built into it instantaneously, no reproduction necessary, and he puts two people in the middle of the Garden Eden to be the caretakers and watchers. And then underneath that scenario, then only the humans are going to be reproducing, and none of the animals will be reproducing for the same reason that, again, you have a full level of population and no new growth can be possible or else death is going to take place. So either way, you're going to reach a point in the perfect world where no reproduction continues for all the animals. And so whether it takes place at the very beginning because the earth is already filled up, or whether it takes place far in the future because they're now spreading and growing and, and developing and spreading to new places, it has to be one of those two options. Um, if we follow your proposal, which is a fascinating one, forward, it seems to me that we end up with God creating Tyrannosaurus Rex. Okay, dinosaurs, um, that's right. Uh, I have no inspiration that says dinosaurs were created or that dinosaurs were not created. There are two statements by Ellen White which have been used to say that dinosaurs were not created based on amalgamation statements that uh, are used to refer to dinosaurs by us. However, I've looked at those statements exhaustively in the context of the statements as well as the time period in which she wrote them, and neither one of those statements really can provenly be describing dinosaurs. So those statements are really have to be pushed to the side as not useful enough to tell us yes or no on this, on this subject. So it becomes a question of how did the dinosaurs get here? Personally, I have looked at dinosaurs as a naturalist. I find them to be extremely well-designed, extremely well-built animals, where three-fourths of them are vegetarian animals. Some of them are tiny little guys that stand two feet tall. Some of them are gigantic, huge cows walking around the landscape eating uh, plants. And uh, then you have the small proportion of the dinosaurs, which are meat eaters. Um, when you look at nature as a whole, you find a very high percentage of any given habitat being made up of herbivores and a small percentage of the rest of the nature being made up of carnivores, which eat the herbivores. And so if you look at our modern habitats, whether it be a rainforest or a desert, doesn't make any difference, you find the majority of animals are plant eaters and some meat eaters feed on them. The majority of dinosaurs were plant eaters and some uh, dinosaurs fed on them. And so you have the same sort of balance in the dinosaurs, the same sort of design, the same sort of structure as any other group of animals. We tend to look at them as these giant horrible monsters from Jurassic Park, but when we really look at them as from Adam's point of view, a 15 foot tall Adam looking up at a brontosaurus is not a whole lot different than a six foot human looking up at an elephant. It's a we're talking about a perspective difference here that they could control them slightly better. I would have said that they are all vegetarians in the Garden of Eden and that at the time of the fall, just like the animals here, some were recreated into a carnivorous state so that they could deal with the uh, habitat control just like any other animal. We know they didn't make it through the flood um, because uh, you know, a variety of reasons of atmospheric uh, pressure and things like that that were different before the flood. When we look at a piece of amber and we take those little air bubbles out of amber and we uh, examine the air qu quality inside those bubbles, we are actually witnessing 5,000 year old atmosphere bubbles that we can actually measure the oxygen content and find that they are higher than we have now. The oxygen content is much, much uh, more intense. And so a higher oxygen content in the atmosphere means that big animals can function in a way that they could never function now. And we have models of the pterodactyl type ones, the huge ones that are like 25 feet across that we've actually built and tried to fly across Texas, I mean, it was like 20 years ago, and they could not get it to fly 
supply without giving them extra motor power and all this kind of thing. And so, in fact, it turned out that in our atmospheric conditions we have today, pterodactyls probably couldn't fly. But in a higher, richer oxygen content pre-flood, uh, they could fly. And so, again, with the giant brontosaurs moving around, various things like that, you have now a situation where post-flood world, humans are getting smaller, they can't control giant animals, the atmosphere is changing totally, and so now you have a situation where the dinosaurs really just can't go on. And so the, one of the major groups of animals that God created is no longer possible to function, and now mammals become the dominant large animals. We have, after the flood, just as big and just as ferocious giant mammals walking across the landscape that did go through the ark. We have giant dire wolves, ground sloths, which are vegetarians, huge giant birds 15 feet tall. We have huge uh, lions living in North America that were uh, like 12 feet long from, from head to tail. We have all sorts of giant, ferocious, meat-eating, mammals that definitely made it through the uh, flood and therefore we presume God made those so why wouldn't he have made dinosaurs as well as part of his original perfect version of all vegetarian animals and some were changed again wild speculation nobody can prove it nobody can disprove it and it becomes merely a point of uh, interest not really something of salvational importance but that's personally what I have looked at as an as a naturalist go ahead um, just a point I felt a little um, when you were comparing fungi with plants, okay. um, both chitin and cellulose belong to the same category of biomolecules, the okay. carbohydrates. And acid by itself doesn't have sufficient specialization to differentiate between different molecules. Okay. What you are trying to say is that there are specialized enzymes okay. in the fungus okay. to break down cellulose. And the enzymes are highly specific for particular molecular structures okay. that are unique to one uh, particular structure mm -hmm. as opposed to a related by slightly different. Okay, so you're not disagreeing with me, you're saying I need to refine my language to, all right, I appreciate that. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Do you uh, look at uh, the uh, <coughs> not the not the app? Well, let me the poison apparatus, but the poison in snakes. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you link that to the poison in the uh, the the vegetable kingdom? Uh, do you connect that at all with Satan? Okay. Um, okay. The, you have in the in the plant world a great many plants which have either toxic latex or co uh, alkaloid compounds or various things like that which can definitely poison certain animals that will feed upon them. And again, these are mostly defensive uh, structures with plants. It's, well, it, it is all defensive structures. And so a plant that gets eaten will uh, make that animal sick and that animal will no longer feed upon it and gives the plant an ability to survive. Um, whether or not those were totally Satan's institutions as part of the fall. Some of those are. Ellen White has uh, talked about that sort of thing a little bit, where we now have those things coming in. Whether some of them were given to some plants as part of God's uh, now protecting them from being totally wiped out, we don't, again, have a hum huge amount of information on that, but I actually have no problem with it being a combination of the two. But when we get to animals, it changes a little bit, because you have some animals, like salamanders, and uh, some species of tree frogs, the uh, poison dart frogs, which have toxic poisons in their skin so that if they are eaten or if they are, if they are the chemical on their skin is broken, uh, toads uh, produce toxins out of their uh, parotid glands. Um, you have a, a situation where the animal who is attacking that is going to become sick or die. And so it is totally a defensive uh, practice in this case. However, if you um, look at some other ones like venomous snakes, it's now an off offensive weapon. And it becomes much more of a, a proactive thing where they're no, now going out and inflicting their venom upon others. When we see snakes, however, they have basically two functions for their venom. Uh, the first ve uh, function is um, to catch their food, and that's their primary purpose of the venom. So when they in, uh, inject their uh, small bit of venom into their rodent, that rodent is going to die very quickly, and it becomes a much easier food item to consume than if it's fighting back and clawing your face and giving you all sorts of damage and, uh, and that sort of thing. The second use of it is self-defense. And this becomes very interesting with snakes because uh, snakes, by far, 
will only use it in self-defense. Now, there are some like the king cobra and some of the mambas and various other species which are aggressive and will actually initiate contact where they have not had anything done to them specifically. They're just having a bad mood one day, apparently, and they decide to attack somebody for no reason. Um, but that is a very small percentage of snake use of venom. I mean, 95% of most snakes will only use it as a self-defense tactic. And they also do not want to use it as uh, any more than they have to because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of resources to produce this venom in their body. And so they're going to not want to waste it on anything that isn't food or isn't an emergency. And so we have with rattlesnakes in North America, which have a, uh, some, depending on the species, very toxic venom, which will defend themselves against an attack, whether it's by us or a wolf or a coyote or anything else like that. And they will only inject the bare minimum venom as, into a situation as possible, or not at all. They will rely on a pure dry bite where no venom is injected whatsoever. And then they will hope that that will scare off the predator and the predator flees and then they can go on their way without having wasted any venom. We actually find about 50% of rattlesnake bites on people are dry bites that have inv inflicted no venom whatsoever. And so snakes don't want to waste it on people. They don't want to waste it on uh, predators unless they absolutely have to. And the older the snake, the more they control their venom because they're smarter, they're more experienced, and so they know that this is not something I want to waste my venom for. The little babies are a little bit more dangerous because it's danger, and so they completely use all their venom at once. So it becomes a self-defense issue with most snakes. They're not really there to cause us problems. And so I do feel that it is part of the natural world, whether it's a defensive toxin in a, in a passive way or an offensive toxin we use to catch their prey, that um, God has built into certain animals um, this ability to have venom. Now, that does not mean that uh, all the uh, killing and everything else of people in, in some of these third world countries where all the venom is uh, um, used all the time by these uh, cobras and things like that have killed lots of people is God's fault. I think Satan has taken what God has done as a beneficial thing and he has twisted it to become a very evil thing in many parts of the world where you have no protection and no way of dealing with it and a lot of people are killed by it. So I would say that in the same way that teeth of a tiger are given to them by God at the time of the fall, and it's purely supposed to be a thing where that tiger is out there eating an antelope, um, you now have some tigers in certain situations becoming man-eaters and using their teeth to kill people, and that wasn't God's will. That's part of Satan's uh, distortion. So also you have venom and poison which are given to certain animals by God which are distorted by Satan's curse of sin to now hurt many people. So that's what I would feel with that. Before we go on, I'll point out that uh, it's a little bit past 11.30, yes. and uh, whenever you need to uh, That's right. close up, you're welcome I, to I do will, so. I am ready to quit any time everybody okay. stops asking questions, but, we do have but another, I will answer uh, any questions you have. We do have another comment did I, at least. Did I answer all of your question or, or not? Did I answer all of your question? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, I, I, my thing is basically snakes as a whole. There's actually the higher proportion of snakes do not have venom. Um, I mean, we're talking about maybe 60, 70 percent of snakes do not have venom of any sort. And so I say snakes as a whole are part of the beneficial part of of rodent regulation that take place. The fact that some have venom is a very useful tool that they use to be even more efficient in getting uh, as the uh, rodent population in their particular area. Um, the ones that do not have venom have to struggle a little bit harder. Um, they have to fight with prey that fights back and this sort of thing and it becomes a little bit more difficult for them and, so, and they're not quite as efficient in doing so. But I say snakes as a whole are definitely part of the ecosystem regulation God set into place. Uh, yes. As a result of the enemy. Yes. That, yes. That is something that we don't need as a benefit. That's right. And and most of these are very toxic poisonous things that are hurting us when we try to use them. And so I would say the majority of that is probably Satan's um, making life miserable for us. Where with snakes, they actually have a beneficial function. Poisonous plants do not have many beneficial functions for anything. Matthew, I, I know you wouldn't yes. want this presentation to conclude without somebody asking the question of, if mushrooms are scavengers, should we be eating them? This is the question I will not answer. <laughs> I refuse to answer this question. So I am not a dietitian. I'm not the, oh, 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 okay. Okay, I just missed it.
Yeah. Oh, no, All right. I, I just missed a step. Okay. Um, I am not a dietitian or the son of a dietitian, and so I will leave that to others more qualified than myself to answer. And so uh, that's right. Every every presentation I have given this time, uh, in this message, I always get that question. So I feel glad that you have fulfilled that duty, and since nobody else had. <laughs> <laughs> Just one other curious question here. Uh, when were the Venus flytraps created? Yes, those are fun. Carnivorous plants, Venus flytraps, um, bladder pods, uh, pitcher plants, and sundews. When were those created? Um, if they're eating insects, which uh, is their primary source of nitrogen and various uh, 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 attributes that they don't get from a uh, normal situation they're in, um, I say that has to be post-sin because of two reasons. It, number one, the places that they live are marginal nutrient habitats. All of the carnivorous plants are in places that barely can sur survive that type of life except for a few of the pitcher plants in tropical areas which are more of a just part of the whole ecosystem as a whole. But all the sundew, all the, um, the Venus flytraps, all these ones that we're uh, more familiar with here in North America are all living in places which barely can support a specific type of life. And so they are just barely hanging on in those dry, the dry or wet, swampy, uh, or uh, desolate little places, usually back east, but uh, there's some places up in serpentine um, rock areas of Northern California where pitcher plants are very common as well. And so it's like nothing else can grow there and nothing else can live here except for these carnivorous plants, which are able to supplement their diet with, a, uh, with the insects um, and fill in those gaps in their nutrient content. And so, um, obviously those types of habitats didn't exist in Eden because you never had anything just barely hanging on um, in a perfect uh, Eden uh, situation. And so that had to be a post-flood, um, I mean a post-fall uh, modification of these plants because you now had habitats that required that sort of life to be uh, able to do so. And again, eating the insects I would say would be something totally post-fall. I, I, I definitely pulled those. So it does fall into this category of predation. It just is now with a plant. I thought they might help keep the fly population down in the Garden of Eden. It's, it's what? Say it again. They might help keep the fly population down <laughs> in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> hey, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, have you linked the three curses with your presentation? Um, in what way specifically do you mean? That uh, could it be that uh, when God spoke to the serpent, He says, "Cursed art thou mm -hmm. above all behemoth." Mm -hmm. That would be all. That'd be like a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. The snake was cursed, but also other animals okay. instantaneously. Yes. yes. And then the curse uh, on the vegetable kingdom, and mm -hmm. then on the face of the earth would be the third curse on the mineral kingdom. Yes. Okay. That's actually, and I have not linked it to that specifically, but actually, that makes uh, actually a good a uh, lot of sense. Um, with the uh, curse of sin on snakes specifically, I find to be a really fascinating area because here you have taken the most beautiful animal in the garden. The most, uh, in the Hebrew of Genesis 3, 1, it's called the most prudent animal of all nature that uh, is now cursed to crawl upon its belly. Now, Ellen White tells us they had wings, so we kind of know that. We, whether they had legs as well, she's not specific, so they might have had legs and wings and been the original dragon that all mythology has taken their imagery from. Uh, but we know they, have, they had wings. And so the wings are removed, and they are now made to crawl upon their belly. The cursed are you. And so now this snake is now cursed. All right, and, but you're like you're saying, it's the beginning of a whole other thing that's taking place because all nature is cursed as well. It's now all subject to death and disease and decay and no longer functions as it did in the perfect world. And so it kind of has like the symbolic curse given to the snake which represents the curse given to all of nature. Now there's two things that I find really interesting about this. I think all nature is severely damaged in this uh, original curse and snakes are given the bad rap as they're the evil ones and they're the ones that we have to hate because God cursed them and therefore we should curse them as well. Um, what did God do to the snakes when he took away their wings? Did he throw them on their ground and now say, function as best you can because I'm not going to help you ever again, you're cursed. If they did so, that snake would be writhing upon the ground with no ability to move because if you take away the only way of locomotion for an animal and you tell it to function in another way, you're going to be in a lot of trouble as an animal. So instead, God gave to the snakes a com completely 
unique system of locomotion, that their underbelly is now made up of overlapping scales from their neck all the way down to their tail, and each one of these overlapping scales is independently controllable by the snakes so that they can hook onto any irregularity on the ground in front of them with all the scales at once, and then they somehow are able to pull themselves forward with a muscular contraction of their body so that they can slide and glide forward over almost any terrain except for the absolute slickest surface possible. And so you have snakes now which are the ultimate masters of movement when it comes to moving around. They're fast, they're agile, they can climb trees, they can move over sand dunes, they can move across almost any kind of unusual circumstance that allows them to, uh, you know, would be a barrier for almost any other type of animal. And so for the snakes, they're actually in many ways blessed with their movements ability now that the wings are removed. So when God took away their wings, he actually gave them an entirely different system of locomotion that allows them to function in ways that virtually no other animal can do so. Also, with dealing with the curse, a side issue, you have legless lizards that have no legs that move around on the ground or in sand or whatever that are also basically the same as snakes. You can tell them apart because of their eyelids and ear holes and things like that. But um, are they cursed? Were they cursed with uh, the curse of sin because they no longer can walk around on legs like all other lizards can? You know, that seems a very strange thing that they would be in the same boat as the snakes and they weren't responsible at all. So in fact, legless by itself is not really a curse. It's a different modification of life that God has chosen to invest with these particular animals. But he has basically taken the snake as the one that Satan has impersonated in the garden and used that as his symbol of what he is doing to Satan. In, in this way, he's cursed Satan, he has cursed the serpent, and we now have them crawling around on the surface. And uh, we always say, well, it's Satan, is the, it, snakes are the, serp are the symbol of Satan, and therefore, you know, we should hate them and everything else like that. We also forget that Christ also used the serpent as his symbol in the Israelites when he had the serpent bronze on, on the uh, pole, and everybody looked to that as their save. Uh, as their salvation. And so Christ used the serpent imagery for himself as well as in the Bible using it for Satan. So I think we have a lot of prejudices there which are unjustified in our actual reality. Yes? I, I guess I can't, having come from the Northwest, I can't let the day go without challenging your ideology look at evil ranching, evil hunting, and the fact that somehow those have destroyed the land and, the hum and that humans, again, are the cause of all evil, which is the traditional evolutionary approach, is the, the humans are the cause of all the problems here on Earth. Since the productivity of the land has increased by the ranchers, and I've lived there and watched that, although that's not what's commonly taught, it's what's observed when you're there, since the number of animals on the land that it can support goes up by that, and since the, I don't understand the predator birds part, because they're all highly protected, and so from a human standpoint, that's a protected area. And the management of the, the predators is also done in a fashion to try and keep a reasonable number so that other populations don't go up and down too much. And in fact, the wolves have gone way out of line in the Northwest in terms of volume and the amount of productivity that they said they were going to do and the amount of reproduction. And you're going to disagree with me on that. And I'm going to strongly disagree with you with that with facts, too. So I didn't want to let it go without being a little challenged from a different point of view, because that's an idealistic point of view from, I think, from a non-existent or a non-observational view in the area. It just fits well with academia and some people's ideologies of evil man and how we're going to mess things up. But it doesn't fit with the numbers of the animals over the years. OK. All right. Um, I will give my personal bias. I despise meat eating. I despise meeting in all its forms. It is a wicked practice that destroys animals in slavery, um, but where we are taking a living, sentient beings and turning them into an item of food to satisfy our taste buds. All right, so that's my prejudice that I will give you as my basic foundational uh, bias so you know where I'm coming from. Um, we are vegetarian uh, human beings which have chosen to eat meat against the wishes of God and against the uh, in, um, structure of our bodies. Um, we can't digest it properly, like I mentioned, and so there's no physical reason that we need to be doing it unless in absolute emergencies. And so the meeting industry as a whole has uh, done two things with uh, the meat in industry. It has turned uh, animals into profit machines, which are basically serving a uh, monetary structure function for so whoever owns them. 
And we now take those animals and say, that animal has no feelings and has no uh, interest in anything around it because my feelings and interests are more important than it is, and I can now destroy it uh, to suit my whims. Um, that is the same justification that was used for human slavery throughout history, and is, was the same justification that was used to um, allow uh, human slavery in North America until 100 years ago. And so now we take animals and we say that they are part of our ownership of the land and therefore we can destroy them as we will. We have taken animals and put them into factory farms, which are the most intense, brutal systems of oppression that we have ever invented in the food industry. And we put animals into these tight containers where they never move and never breathe and never exist in any kind of natural habitat until we take them away in very painful conditions and destroy them for our taste buds. Um, the ranching industry has not done that because the ranching industry is out in the uh, open lands where various uh, wildlife ecosystems are already in place. And so the ranching industry raises those animals in uh, places where there are um, open conditions for a certain amount of time and then they take those animals and then they put them into the uh, feedlot area conditions which are virtually factory farm conditions and then kills them for their profit. Because of the complete utter disregard for the native animals that live in these places, ranching has made it possible for us to basically um, wholesalely destroy predators over the last uh, 200 years. Uh, wolves were exterminated entirely from the lower 48 states. Um, grizzlies were pushed out virtually out, uh, to, out uh, as well. Um, wolverines as well, all the different predators uh, under two systems, both the individual ranchers who, which were killing these animals for their uh, protection of their herds, as well as government killing, which uh, uh, takes place to this day where there is about um, a million animals per year, year killed by wildlife services in North America. And we are now destroying animals uh, this very minute, this very second, um, birds, mammals, rodents, all the different uh, uh, anything that competes supposedly with the ranching interests are killed um, by the government to support the ranching industry. So we do have wildlife uh, destruction right now of predators um, for the ranching industry. Now, um, 15 years ago, wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park as part of a long-term process to restore our native national parks to their original conditions that we had before we destroyed various species of predators. Um, in Yellowstone, uh, the population uh, expanded quite quickly and uh, filled out the ecosystem and spread out beyond its borders to other places. Um, it has caused various um, anger issues with various ranchers because um, they are now killing the cattle and killing the sheep and killing people's you know, backyard wildlife and stuff like that. And so uh, the elk industry is very upset because there are not as many elk to um, shoot and put the heads on the walls for ourselves. And so uh, there is a great deal of industry anger that is directed against wolves. Um, it has become a political issue because uh, the people who want wolves protected have gone to court and gone to legal situations and tried to pass laws. Um, a year ago, um, after 15 years of protection underneath the Endangered Species Act of wolves, a rider was attached to a congressional bill that had nothing to do with wildlife and nothing to do with wolves, and that basically stripped the wolves of all protection that um, had been given to them so that now they can be killed by the individual states to suit the individual state's whims. No protection of any kind is now left in any area that is outside a national park. And so in the last uh, eight months, basically, starting last fall and heading into the spring, um, the wolves have been killed um, quite, quite graphically and gorily, as can be found on the internet uh, websites that are now documenting what's happening. Um, there's just been a one that went viral a, a few weeks ago where a wolf in a trap, um, still alive, was being bragged about by this state um, agency man who was uh, doing it for the state, and he was getting all his friends and shooting the wolf and, and torturing it until he died. Um, this uh, has gotten quite uh, a lot of attention. There have been death threats against the people who exposed this uh, particular uh, case of killing. And so there's huge anger and huge bitterness that goes on between the two sides and becomes a, just a virtually unending source of anger and frustration from both parties involved. Um, if we eliminated ranching entirely from North America, two things would happen. Um, we would restore the um, natural habitats that the ranching industry has damaged quite badly to a much more 
um, a much more healthy state. The ranching industry, especially the cattle, has damaged forest ecosystems, riparian ecosystems, and grassland ecosystems to the point where they are virtually um, nothing like they're supposed to be. And so that would be a great benefit as well. But however, our meat supply, unfortunately, would not drop at all because the ranching industry is responsible for only about 5 to 10 percent of our meat supply. Most of it is from factory farming. And so if we eliminated ranching entirely, no meat level reduction would really take place. It would mean a few ranchers would go out of business and you would have uh, less of that sort of thing happening in the Northwest. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that would be a wonderful thing. I would like to see all ranchers get uh, a better, more uh, humane lifestyle for their, for their jobs that would not include killing animals to put money in their pocket. Um, but that, of course, is a very prejudicial view, and I'm sure that uh, that is seen as something that is not reasonable by uh, clear-thinking individuals who want to see a balance of all things. And I don't make any pretense to that. I am opposed to slavery in all its form, whether it's toward people or animals. And so ranching is, and the factory farming industry is our modern, modern version of slavery, and I have no problem standing underneath that banner. Um, Waste of the West by Lynn Jacobs uh, was a book written in the 70s which documented this quite well in terms of the actual habitat conditions that uh, have taken place and the ways that they have been degraded over time. I would, uh, I would uh, give his authority a great deal of uh, credibility because he did back up his facts quite well. Sorry to be contradictory, but uh, that's something I have great passion about. <laughs> if I have understood it correctly, you say that one of the reasons that we need pre predators mm -hmm. is because if they weren't there, um, herbivores populations will grow yes. without control. Yes. And my question is, if predator populations are controlled by the amount of food they have and they don't grow without yeah. control. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, the large herbivores like elephants or rhinoceros or mm -hmm. others that they are not really controlled by predators, their population numbers. Mm -hmm. And also there are some small islands w uh, where you don't have top predators because there are not enough mm -hmm. herbivores for them and populations that are controlled only by the amount of food they have. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be possible that that they didn't need to change to carnivores and all the control was like that after the fall and mm -hmm. this is something different. You really don't need that. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna deal with you know, this in parts. Um, that's a good question. Uh, in the first case, when we're dealing with very large animals, which don't seem to have um, any obvious predators like elephants and you know, rhinos and hippos and things like that, very few of which are killed by a predatory system, you also tend to find one thing with those very large animals. Their reproductive rate is quite low. And so you do not have a huge explosion of their numbers um, to the point where they're eating out all their food supplies and things like that, um, in the, as you had with rabbits and rodents and, and insects and various things like that. And so apparently, God set into effect um, a system where the smaller the animal, the more vulnerable the animal to predation, the higher their reproductive rate and their ability to uh, withstand predator losses where the larger ones do not have nearly so much a need for that and so their reproductive rate is uh, much much lower so I would say that as far as that um, part of it now with the island do you, do you want to follow up on that yeah okay. I can say it couldn't be the rates of reproduction and adaptation after the fall and at the yeah. beginning everyone was reproducing at the rate that they really need well, to, to go yeah. to carrying capacity and then it's all yes uh, yes, and again, like, we don't know how much reproduction was taking place before the fall, if any. We, we, we don't have, you know, we can speculate on that, but we don't know for sure. And so did he, uh, did God institute a changed rate of reproduction at the time of the fall, or did he simply reintroduce re reproduction at the time of the fall? We don't know for sure about that. That is, that is definitely a speculation. Now with the island ecosystem habitat, that's a little bit more uh, difficult because you have a situation where um, a small ecosystem with very few parts compared to a continent 
is having to deal with increases and de decreases in population of the, uh, inherit, uh, the uh, native animals. Um, there are still predators on these islands um, because you still have snakes and birds of prey and uh, various uh, small uh, mammals which can, will reach some of these island areas which will be carnivorous. Now, the most e extremely remote islands will have far fewer of those types of animals and so we're going to have less of that ecosystem um, that's going on. But all ecosystems have predators, even the most remote. And it, when we talk about insects and spiders and things like that, they're everywhere. And so you have to deal with them as well. Um, the, you do not have any really large reproducing populations of, of animals on islands. You don't seem to have a huge amount of rabbits or rodents or things like that on most of these islands that are so full of them that you have uh, a complete overpopulation of them. And so it seems to stay more in balance with some of these habitats because they uh, seem to have less of the hugely reproducting ones that are in there. But it is true that obviously you're going to have a certain set of species on an island which eventually is going to reach the capacity of the island habitat to sustain it and then it merely becomes a matter of uh, starvation and survival and whichever is the most fit is going to be able to be survive another day and the one that isn't quite as uh, fit is going to die and it becomes a little bit harsher and so I think that that is um, true that they in fact demonstrate what we're talking about here because they are in fact a uh, showing the ways that these animals will only be able to reach a certain level. Um, you have down on Christmas Island the crab population, these red crabs which are super abundant and they are actually just you know, all over the place and they're in fact one of the keystone species of that habitat because of all the stuff they do in the soil and eating the various things that are around them and in fact they're just uh, hugely important. Now they're all dying off because introduced species have come in and they're actually killing these crabs and now the population is dropping off and, and you have a kind of a chain reaction that takes place that is leading to uh, various crises. So under normal circumstances, uh, how does that crab population stay regulated? We're not really sure because we didn't study it before they started to be regulated by um, invasive species and so we're not really sure. This is actually one area of science which is trying to play catch up because when we go to an island as a scientist, well we're already looking at at least 150, 200 years of contamination of various introduced species and how did it originally function and how did it originally work in this uh, in a situation before these invasive species got here. That's a very difficult area of study and so it's, uh, it's still something that we need to figure out a little bit better. First, I'd like to commend you for the excellent illustrations that go with the presentation. You commend my wife. She's the one who is uh, oh, <laughs> responsible for that, um, yeah. more often than not. <laughs> uh, superb. So I hope you can uh, share this in many settings, in many ways. I think it stimulates a lot of thought, as you can tell here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe many of us will look at it a little differently, but uh, mm -hmm. we do appreciate what you've done here. Um, one thing that I think comes through very strongly is that we dare not, as Christians, give Satan credit for activities that he really is not involved in. Yes. It's almost like Christians want to pat Satan on the back and say, look at all the marvelous things yes, you have done. That's right. And we've just negated the argument for all the wondrous things God has done in the yep. natural world. Yep. So I would concur with you very strongly that, um, that you have divine design activity involved in these creatures. Sometimes we call it adaptation, but I think it's a lot more than that, mm -hmm. of structures that are meant for survival and at all levels. We can see it, frankly, all levels of nature. I had one uh, thought that struck me about uh, Genesis 1, the perfect world, mm -hmm. where Adam and Eve are told to be fruitful and multiply, but that same command is given at the fifth day of creation, as you know, mm -hmm. for the animals, at least the sea creatures and the birds of the air. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to open the door for one possibility that there was no reproduction. I know, I know. <laughs> that in my mind clashes with that text in Genesis yeah. which clearly is reproduction. That mm -hmm. same phrase, phraseology, be fruitful and multiply, mm -hmm. is in Exodus chapter 1 
uh, verse 7, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous. Mm -hmm. So you have Israelites kind of filling the land yes. uh, in the same way that God set up all of creation. So I have a little well, cognitive yes. dissonance okay. with that part of your presentation. Uh, I would say this. I gave the two options as yeah. to what could I have appreciate happened. that. Yeah. As, you know, we have to choose because it has to be one of those two options. You know, that, you know, I'm just going from a logical stance there okay. of saying, what are the two possibilities? Right. I personally favor the fact that uh, God made a certain core and allowed them to reproduce until filling um, the entire world. So I would actually favor that by far yeah. as being the most likely of the two options. But uh, I'm just giving them as options to say, this is what we have to choose from. So. Uh, yeah, that's from a logical standpoint. Do you know of any scientists or theologians that are pursuing the second option? I mean, oh no, I don't. It's purely <laughs> theoretical. Yes, yes, I, I, yes. You know, to me, uh, that was it, a sidetrack on your okay, talk. I, yeah. yes, I it kind of that. pulled me off course okay. there for a gotcha. little while. Gotcha. But I see where you're coming from. Yes. As far as the first part goes, um, the reason I decided to do this um, over the years was I got so tired of hearing about, oh yeah, that's an evil animal, and that's Satan is animal, and that's, oh look what Satan's amalgamation has done, and all this kind of stuff, and it just got, you know, what, do you, what animal are you looking at? Because I'm looking at animal really well designed, and really well built, and really well functional. And so the entire reason for this presentation was to counteract that idea that um, so many animals are Satan's animals, which is just very, very poor. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I guess one uh, one thing I think we have to be careful of is is making these categories absolutely exclusive. Yes. Yes. Um, it is possible that a certain amount of uh, what some people would call evolution um, that's semi randomly based mm -hmm. um, may coexist with some of God's creation. Yes. And uh, uh, for example, I don't think that God has to create specifically uh, the uh, white coloring of, of bears and Arctic foxes yes. and, yes. and That's so right. forth. That those, yes. are, those are actually degenerative changes yes. that uh, are advantageous for an animal in a particular mm -hmm. environment. Yes. And so um, at least some of it may very well be, uh, in fact, uh, uh, an evolutionary change, and for example, uh, cats require taurine that yes. they don't get in that's right. a plant-based diet very well, mm -hmm. and uh, that's very dis very possibly a a uh, an artifact that's happened afterwards. Where since you don't since you get all the taurine you need in your diet, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a mutation that that wipes it out. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yes. And in fact, there are pseudogenes for the enzymes that would normally create taurine mm -hmm. in a cat. They just don't function. So we're probably looking again at a, what some people would call evolution, what I would prefer to call degeneration. Yeah. Um, and I think also we have to be a little bit careful even about the nice sharp teeth and so forth because if you ever look at the sharp teeth of fruit bats, they Looks like they do a pretty good number on some animal. Yes, uh, yes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the diet is completely deceptive that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. So, well, that's actually one reason that for a long time we have been labeled as carnivores because we have the front canines and things like that, when in fact we're not built for that at all. Um, frugivores is what our category fits into. And so the teeth of our own jaws are the same as the teeth of, of, of several species of primates, which are frugivores, as, as well as the fruit bats, which are frugivores type bats that uh, it uh, definitely falls into that category. It can mimic carnivorous teeth that way. Yeah. And maybe we even were the source of carnivorous teeth at one yeah. point. Yeah, that's right. We also find something very interesting about the phosphate contact, uh, content of teeth where um, it is the phosphate content is much higher in the uh, predatory animals so that they can break 
through bones and shatter through very, very hard substances, where if we take that same bone and try and break through it with our own teeth, we're going to have broken teeth before we ever break through the bone. And so there's even structural integrity issues which have been built into the carnivorous teeth that we don't have as well. I would just add to say to what you just said there that I agree with everything you just said. That is actually uh, totally, uh, you know, 100% right with all of this kind of thing. This gets into the whole issue of macroevolution compared to microevolution and which one did God put into the natural world and which one has um, the Darwinists claimed for the natural world and combined the two to promote their own ideas. That's a whole other topic, but that gets into this sort of generation. Yes. Of, your, of the two possibilities of the creation being complete versus expanding, and uh, would the time period, if the time period between creation and the fall and then the flood, mm -hmm. um, would there be enough time to produce as much coal and as much oil as there is if he hadn't created the earth almost? It just seems like we would have a hard time in that time period yeah. from a garden yeah. expanding yes. to the point that you have the volume of oil By and the coal. time the flood occurs, the animals have just barely filled out the land. And so, yeah, it's right. That is actually one of the logical premises why the other option is perhaps an option. And that's why I will not state categorically one way or the other. I favor one option as the one that seems to make more sense to most evidence, but it's not cut and dried, and there are definitely other options that, uh, and other reasons why the other option may make more sense as well. So uh, personally, uh, it's not something I'm going to fight for one way or the other, uh, but it's, it's something worth discussing. Yeah. Well, obviously this bug is the devil. There is with his <laughs> horns. Anyway, um, yeah, so my question is, you mentioned fruitarian, basically, so y you feel that we should actually be fruitarians? And yes, uh, oh. I, I definitely believe that we should be vegetarians, um, which are, uh, I mean, we have a teeth structure in our jaws which do three things. Um, when we look at a carnivorous animal, a cat is a good example. They have, they have the perfect teeth structure for eating flesh. They have very, very sharp, small front teeth. They have huge fangs on either side, canine fangs, with which can pierce the skull or the throat of a uh, prey item and suffocate it or kill it directly. And then, once they have killed it, now they have very sharp, shearing teeth on the sides of their jaws with which they can now cut through the skin and the flesh and break it down in, into a chunk that they can now swallow. And so if you ever watch your cat eating that mouse after he's killed it, he turns his head on his side yeah, and yeah. he gnaws on it so that he can use those side back teeth. Mm -hmm. Then we look at a cow or a, a pure grass eater and they have these huge flat grinding surfaces with which they can grind up the very, very tough grass, uh, very, very uh, very, very, very tough. Gr I mean, you know, we don't real realize how tough this stuff is to grind and digest when we just see it in the field. Um, this is a, not an easily digested substance, and so they have to be able to grind and mash it and get it broken down so their uh, stomach can even begin to work on it. And so they have pure grinding surfaces with very few, um, uh, you know, piercing parts and only a few, you know, cropping parts to cut off the leaves and branches. And the three stomachs don't. Yeah, either, right? that's right, the three stomachs. Not all grass eaters have that, but you know, for the cows, they definitely do. Um, and then you have us, and our teeth are kind of this weird combination of both of those two. We have the front canines that are not as big in proportion to our jaw as the cats and the meat eaters. We have cutting front teeth, which are very similar to uh, meat eating uh, front cutting teeth. And then we have grinding molars on our side, which are totally different than meat eaters, but um, are much more similar to the grass eaters. And so we have this kind of a hybrid combination of our jaw structure, which allows us to eat more uh, softer foods than the pure vegetarian grass uh, plant eater. Um, it's, we, can, we need something that we can't just go out in the field and start eating the hay. It's not going to be able to be digested. We're not going to be able to function with it. And so our jaws need something a little bit softer and a little bit more tender. And so that's where we get into the fruits and the vegetables and things like that. We can process grain very well after we uh, process it and great, get it into a state that we can actually uh, deal with. But uh, our teeth are not really built just to gnaw it off of the stock. 
And so our teeth structure really, really does fit perfectly with a frugivore lifestyle. And there's, it's a very small percentage of life that actually fits frugivore. It's actually kind of a mm -hmm. small group. And so you actually have a very specific set of conditions that we seem to fit perfectly. How about with uh, vegetables, like celery or Yeah, like and this? again, that or falls into the same kind of category. Frugivore vegetable. really covers vegetables oh, as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, frugivore is the technical term. But and, it and I know they always mention the length of the intestines, too. Yes. But um, the intense intestine length is much longer with vegetarian um, animals because it is harder to break down plant material into digestible nutrients, and so you need more time for it to go through the entire system. Where a carnivorous diet, it's the, f the nutrients are much more readily digestible, and so it has le needs less time to get the nutrients out of it. Plus, it is very toxic. When you eat another animal and it's going through your system, it's rotting, it's causing problems, you need to get it out of there as quick as you possibly yeah. can. And so it's a much shorter intestine for meat eaters to allow them to process food quickly through their body, where with us, we want to keep it inside as long as possible, get every last nutrient content out of it before we expel it and move it on to the next one. And so the length of the intestine is a key indicator in the type of plant food or animal food you will be built to eat. One thing that I think is important in this regard is if you look at the original diet, um, the, uh, the animals were given every green plant. We were given every fruit, uh, every uh, fruit-bearing seed. Yes. So it, it sounds like uh, even in the text there's a, a differentiation yes, there is. between our diet and the diet of the standard animal. That's right. That's correct. Um, yep. the, one of the things that I was thinking about is logically, if you're not going to have death, then you have to have uh, uh, birth control, if you please, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which kind of leads us to the uh, to the. Uh, it sounds like eventually even humans are going to have to have birth control because when we fill up the earth, yes. uh, then unless uh, we're prepared to thin out the herd with starvation <laughs> and so forth, we're going to have to start right. reproducing. Yes. The other planets where um, sin has never occurred in the universe, where life, uh, every, as Ellen White says, every world has had a tree of knowledge of good and evil placed upon it, and we never chose to, and they never chose to uh, partake of it because of what they had seen here on earth. Um, what is happening with them? Are they reproducing? Are they, it doesn't seem likely that they've, fill, you know, that they've been f reproducing for the last 6,000 years either. So, I mean, it becomes a question of how does God control that? Uh, does he just say, all right, that's it, you're, you're done, no more? You know, does he put that into us um, just biologically? Or does he uh, have the, us uh, you know, participate in that practice ourselves? I mean, we have no idea, but it makes sense that that would have happened eventually. Okay. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. With, uh, there's. Uh, we're presuming that uh, the, there's plenty of room in the universe to expand, and they can uh, move to new areas and things like that. And that's very possible as well. Um, whether or not they were going to do so in the original Earth, again, total speculation. Could you say one thing about what do you? D uh, how do you evaluate the snakes that are constrictors? There are two ways that snakes kill: either through poison and biting, yes. or constricting. Yes. Uh, did God had two ways? Uh, Oh, yes. Um, in the, yeah, I, the, definitely, because uh, you have constricting, where basically you are taking an animal, cutting off its air supply. Every time they breathe out, you constrict a little tighter until it can no longer breathe. That's actually a reasonably fast way to kill an animal when you compare it to some of the ways that a lion has to do it. You know, if they're not big enough to close off the air supply, sometimes it takes a long time for you know, uh, that to take place. So constriction is actually f fairly reasonable for a small rodent to be constricted in that way. There are other ways that other snakes will actually feed. Some will just uh, um, bite it and hold on to it and just use their jaw strength. That's actually some of the smaller snakes will do that with some of their insect prey. But it is the uh, dominant form is either venom or constriction as the two main ways that that takes place. So I would say it's purely a uh, variation of technique that um, is given to different animals and each one does it in a certain way. Um, there are certain types of, uh, you know, if you look at a shark, they basically take a big bite out of an animal and that basically kills it uh, instantaneously. 
um, where um, if you are a predatory um, cheetah that you need to catch your antelope, um, you're suffocating it. Um, if you are uh, able to break a neck, you know, I mean, there's just lots of different variations on this that takes place that uh, um, a constriction of snakes would sim simply be another variation. So you, you feel that the um, fruitarian or some vegetables, I mean, but is it mostly fruit that you're talking about that actually we get enough nutrients from from the fruit or uh, what kind no, of? No, uh, not really. I would say that you need a totally balanced diet, especially in uh, here we are at the end of history where our bodies are not really um, nearly as healthy as they were in the original Eden uh, diet. If you were Adam coming out of Eden, you were just virtually perfect at that point, and you could process nutrients much better than we now. We're, we're now at the end of 6,000 years of degradation, that we have a great deal uh, harder time with our physicality, and so we need to make up the nutrients as best we can. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say today especially, we need a balanced diet of every available plant type of uh, amino acid and every type of uh, plant uh, uh, you know, nutrients that you get, and that it comes from all sorts of uh, fruits and vegetables and grain and uh, nuts and all sorts of different things like that that would make it possible to. So uh, pro probably you could you could say then that basically man could not live in a natural environment anymore because he just there's not the variety of foods. So yeah, it's it, you know, it, it becomes quantities. very difficult if you're just out in yeah. the woods by yourself. Um, it's hard starve. to get a full uh, <laughs> yeah. nutrient content to really, really be healthy anymore. That's, that's a product of 6,000 years that's of sin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm a dentist, so I have to wonder. Uh, you mentioned something about um, more phosphorus in the animal's teeth that you know, allows them to break bone. Do you think that due to increased longevity pre-flood that maybe human teeth may have also had that? Because they have to last hundreds of years, and that's almost inconceivable. It's very possible. And again, that could be another uh, instance of degradation. Uh, what we find with the uh, phosphate, human teeth usually contain 1.5% phosphate of magnesia, whereas the teeth of carnivores are composed of nearly 5% phosphate of magnesia. And so that's what gives us the hardness of for, the, for the predators, allows them to break them open and do things like that. So yeah, uh, whether or not our teeth were stronger to begin with, sure could be. Yeah, that's very, very possible. All thank right. You. Thank you very much for right. your presentation. All right. Thank you.